Good evening and thank you for joining us. Our top story, Interior Secretary Ken Salazar made a major announcement today regarding future development of the National Petroleum Reserve Alaska. Proposed management plan that will allow development on nearly 12 million of NPRA's 23 million acres, a 50 50 split between protected areas and land for oil leasing. Areas designated for development cover 72% of the estimated recoverable oil in the reserve and would allow the potential construction of a pipeline that could carry oil from wells in the Beaufort and Chukchi Seas as well. The plan also protects environmentally sensitive areas such as bird habitat and calving grounds. Senator Mark Begich said today that, that this is a sign of progress. We're going to have a pipeline corridor going through National Petroleum Reserve, uh, both east to west and north to south. Why is that important? Because that will ensure the oil and gas that's currently being explored in the Arctic will be able to get to market. And for Alaskans, this means thousands of opportunities of jobs. There's no question about it. Not only building the pipeline, but the Arctic exploration. Board members from the Fairbanks North Star Borough's Municipal Natural Gas Utility are looking at the governor's financial package meant to bring natural gas to Fairbanks. Governor Sean Parnell announced a $355 million financial package to get LNG to the interior. Most of the funding comes from low-cost loans, although there are some grants. The Interior Alaska Natural Gas Utility was formed by the borough, the city of Fairbanks, and North Pole this fall. Now, the borough wants it to be the lowest-cost energy option for consumers in the interior. They hope to cut the cost of energy by 50%. Golden Valley Electric Association has decided not to buy the power plant at the Clear Air Station. The Air Force offered the plant to bidders this past fall since it's going to hook into the interior power grid. But Golden Valley says it wouldn't be worth the cost. There would also be a number of environmental issues to deal with. The 22 and a half megawatt power plant located about 80 miles southwest of Fairbanks off the Parks Highway drew no bids. Alaska Senator Mark Begich says emotions are still too raw after the school shootings in Connecticut to have the kind of broad discussions that new gun control measures deserve. Begich says he'll be cautious about doing anything on new gun laws with the push since the shooting at the Connecticut school. He says they have to be careful not to just throw new laws on the books because of emotion. But he says he won't shy away from challenging the National Rifle Association. Begich believes the larger issue is dealing with mental illness, which he says was a driving factor in the incident. Alaska provisions in a relief bill for states affected by Hurricane Sandy are coming under scrutiny. Some senior Republican senators want to strip aid for the fishery disaster. The bill is a priority of Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid, who says senators must understand the upper chamber will not recess for Christmas until the relief package is finished. The problem is not all the money is pegged for Sandy. Arizona Senator John McCain says he wants the Senate to vote to include or strip the $150 million allocated for fishery disasters. The money would go to Alaska, states in the Northeast and the Gulf Coast. Okay, and Mike Schultz is joining us now with our first look at weather. Now, Mike, it's been cool, it's been warm, it's been snowy, now it's cool. Any chance that we're going to see a warmer weekend? Well, there are we respite today because the cloud cover moved in and gave us a little snow flurry activity but uh, for the most part temperatures are pretty consistent once again in fact you can see if we look across the interior the temperatures are very consistent looking at uh, 27 degrees below in Nenana with uh, very chilly temperatures in Denali Park 34 but otherwise pretty consistent elsewhere 22 below at Delta Junction and 25 below at Allison Air Force Base, and the temperature is pretty consistent right around Fairbanks, Fort Wainwright, and North Pole. There's a big blizzard uh, moving across the lower 48. We'll tell you all about that with all the weather when we come back later on. Also, Fort Wain Wainwright Striker Brigade participate in the Arctic Forge competition. Stay with us. This edition of the Fairbanks Evening News is brought to you by Northland Hearing Services, better hearing with a human touch, and by Fairbanks Memorial Hospital, community owned. And welcome back. The last of eight soldiers implicated in the hazing death of a fellow soldier has cut a deal in his individual case. First Lieutenant Dan Bill J. Schwartz has been discharged from the Army as punishment for his involvement in the October 2011 death of Private Danny Chen. 
Both Schwartz and Chen belong to the 1st Striker Brigade Combat Team 25th Infantry Division. Schwartz and seven other soldiers were charged with physical and verbal abuse that resulted in the suicide of Private Chen last year in Afghanistan. Earl Beislein, a leading figure in the history of mining and higher education in Alaska, has died at the Pioneer's home where he had lived for the last five years. Beislein, age 96, helped to develop the mining engineering programs at the University of Alaska Fairbanks and also was a university administrator who served as provost and dean. He received an honorary degree from the university in 1969. Outside of his university work, he was a mine consultant, a miner, and an active participant on the state and local scene. He was a recipient of countless awards, but always said he was the most proud of his family. Now, memorial services are set for December 29th at the University Community Presbyterian Church at 1 p.m. The schedule will allow most, if not all, of his 13 grandchildren and 26 great-grandchildren to attend. Well, along with decorations, Christmas lights, presents under the tree, another item you see quite often during the holidays is the poinsettia. This plant with its or flower with its familiar red, yellow or pink leaves is native to Mexico, but got its name from the American ambassador to Mexico, Joel Poinsett, in the 1800s. An unusual fact about this variety is that it requires more dark than it does light for the leaves to turn color. Up at the UAF University, they have been growing the flowers since August and have close to 200 that they plan on passing out to the residents of the campus. So the day length has to be less than 12 hours. And usually what we do is we uh, cover them up with a blackout material and we open that in the morning at 8 o'clock and then we close them about 5 before we go home. And that gives the plants 8 to 9 hours of light each day. Or in other words, they get 15 to 16 hours of darkness. One last fact, according to officials at UAF, scientific tests have dispelled the myth about poinsettia leaves causing a danger to pets or children. However, the milky substance from the stalks could cause a reaction to those that have allergies to latex products. Well, audiences will have another weekend set of performances to catch FDA's latest production, E.B. White's Charlotte's Web. The production was set to close this past weekend, but due to the demand and due to extreme weather in Fairbanks, FDA officials decided to continue the play for another weekend. Charlotte's Web is a classic tale of friendships as a lonely pig discovers life on Zuckerman's farm, finding solace with a farm girl and later with a literate spider. Two additional performances have been scheduled for this Friday and Saturday, December 20th and 21st at the Hap Rider Riverfront Theater at 815. We are a family production and so we're gauged more towards um, adolescence up through mature adulthood. Um, little ones might find it a little difficult to stay still, but still a great family story and we want to encourage everyone to come out. The soldiers of the 1st Striker Brigade Combat Team 25th Infantry Division Brigade Troops Battalion recently held the Arctic Forge competition on Fort Wainwright. News Center 11's Monty Bowen has details now in this week's military report. The competition was comprised of seven events that tested the soldiers' physical fitness as well as their ability to complete basic Arctic warrior tasks. It was a 1.8 mile run. Then after that they went to three minutes of push-ups and three minutes of sit-ups. Then they went into a 10-man Arctic tent competition, and they're, they're testing their, their Arctic skills uh, out here on the range. Then they go into a Occhio pool, a uh, snowshoe, and also a cross-country ski. The event provided a unique challenge to all the soldiers who participated. It's really good uh, winter training, so I've actually it, had a good experience because it's like, okay, I probably would never do this, you know, in the lower 48, and now I actually know how to survive you know, in, in situations like this. The Arctic Forge challenged the Grey Wolf soldiers both physically and mentally while simultaneously boosting unit morale. Monty Bowen, News Center 11. The Military Report is brought to you by Stanley Nissan. Innovation for all. From one physical contest to another, we turn to Joe Cook now for a look at preview of sports. What's going oh, on today? Yeah, well, coming up in sports, we acknowledge some accomplished standout shooters mm -hmm. from the high school ranks and both the Nanak basketball teams that ended their games in 2012 on top. That's coming up next in sports. <music> Brought to you by the Law Office of Rita T. Alley. 
peace of mind through professional legal services. First off, there are some congratulations due to some members of the Alaska Nanak Rifle Team. Laurel Stanfield and Ryan Anderson won, won titles in both small bore and air rifle in the Alaska Junior Olympic State Rifle Championships back on Sunday. Lathrop Products Stanfield and the brother-sister duo of Jamie and Kansi Barnes won on two and three in small bore. Ryan Anderson, the Nanak sophomore, won with a 579 out of 600. Hutchison's Gabe Stutz won the Dunham Award, which goes to the best high school small bore shooter. Stutz shot a 5.49, which was the, his personal best, and he takes second behind Anderson. Joshua Smith placed third. A number of high schoolers in the Junior Olympics had their best performances of the year as well. Hutchison's Emma Daniels and Amy Gentry had personal bests, as well as Ashlyn Mahoney of Valdez. For the boys, the standouts were Connor Gilliam of Lathrop, Max Deltzer, and Eric Kirshner of Hutchison, and Mitchell Yarna out of Valdez. The Nanak women's basketball team ended the 2012 portion of their schedule with a win last night for their first pair of consecutive wins of the season. In their first meeting with the Dallas Christian Crusaders, the Nanaks won 96-50 last night in Game 2 of the series with the Crusaders. The Nanaks had a repeat performance winning by 44 points. It was another dominating performance inside with 60 points in the paint. The Nanaks also converted 37 points off of 23 Crusader turnovers. Senior Taylor Altenberg had a game high 13 points, leading four nooks in double figures. 13 Nanak players had played at least 11 minutes. The team defense was in tune, holding Dallas Christian to only 10 mate field goals for the entire game and holding the Crusaders to just 18% shooting. Allison McGinnis had 12 points to lead the Crusaders with a plus 33 advantage on the boards. The Nanaks get a win 84 to 40. Now with two wins under their belt, the Nanaks will be feeling good on their Christmas break. When they return, it will be time to face their conference opponents. The Nanaks open their full GNET schedule at home on January 3rd, taking on Simon Frazier. Staying up on the hill, the men's basketball team was in action in an exhibition game with Multnomah. The Lions were the same team the Nanix defeated on Monday night by an obscene score of 124-59, and that game counted. This one didn't, but the outcome was the same, just with a little less scoring at the Patterson. The Nanix had on their road blues, and they had the blues early on. The Lions, they started the game on an 8 on one Austin Hodges had it going early. He finished with 20 for the Lions, but they couldn't tame the Nanooks, who woke up and started hitting some shots. Pat Voot started it off, then Stefan Tietze had the hot hand, scoring 11 points in eight minutes, hitting his first four shots. Voot and Tietze both went five of seven from three, with Voot leading all scores with 23 points. He added six assists as well. Tietze finished with 19 as five Nanooks were in double figures. The Nanooks shot the ball well, 56% from the field and 13 of 26 from three. Everyone chipped in on the glass, just about 11 of the 12 players who played had at least one rebound as the Nanooks earned a plus 21 rebound advantage, which got, to, which got the Nanooks on the break. 23 fast break points for the Nooks. The final was 97 to 62. It'll be something if the Nanooks could continue this kind of play in the new year when they start GNAC conference games. The six and four Nanooks will be on the road January 3rd in Ellens, Ellensburg, Washington, taking on the Central Washington Wildcats. And finally tonight, we have our You Pick 'em Pro Football Challenge winner. And this week's winner is, can you get a drum roll please? And the winner is Nancy Norman of North Pole. Congratulations, Nancy. Nancy will receive a free oil change courtesy of Gene's Chrysler Dodge and Jeep. If you want to be a winner, then get in on the action. Find out how on our website at webcenter11.com. And that'll wrap things up in sports tonight. Thanks for rocking with me for a little while. Catch more of our KTVF 11 sports coverage on YouTube. Subscribe to the KTVF 11 sports channel to watch more highlights of interior sports action. And we're on Twitter as well at KTVF 11 sports and at KTVF Joe Cook. Stay cool, Alaska. Mike Schultz has your full weather forecast coming up next. We'll catch you next time. Yeah. A little bit of a reprieve from the cold temperatures, but you know what? They're going to get...
actually colder <laughs> tomorrow night. <laughs> oh, man. But then again, then warming back up again by the weekend. So, you know, heading into Christmas, it doesn't look all that bad. Yeah. Looking for a high of around 5 to 10 below. It's not too bad. Yeah. You can handle that, right? Oh, yeah, 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 I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> Let's go out to the airport, see what's going on out there. Right now we have 26 below after a high of 20 below. The record high, that was in 1985, got up to 40 degrees that day. The record low, 52 below in 1933. Sunrise this morning, not quite 11 o'clock in the morning, and the sunset was at 241. That works out to three hours and 43 minutes. Winds are calm, and the barometer is falling at 2935. Well, what's going on as far as their satellite picture? Well, again, you can see we have a little bit of cloudiness moving across from the uh, west to the east, this next band of moisture moving across here, but then the skies start clearing out and things get really chilly. Elsewhere across the state, you can see over southeast Alaska, we're looking at a little bit of cloudiness over there and a lot of wind blowing there too. Now what's happening across the rest of the interior and the states, we can see cloudy skies over here, the uh, southeastern sections, clear skies around Anchorage and Kodiak Island, and elsewhere, we're looking at uh, up and down the west coast. A little bit of snow shower activity around Nome, uh, partly cloudy skies. Elsewhere, clear skies at Barrow and Fort Yukon, partly cloudy. Okay, back to the lower 48. And we have a lot to talk about tonight. The rain falling over the Pacific Northwest again. Lots of snow in the forecast across the central plains and very heavy thunderstorm activity over the deep south, all because on the radar, you can see a real big mixture of rain and snow and everything going on here. The purple indicating frozen precipitation, the blue indicating a strong frontal boundary, all because of an area of low pressure that was developing last night. Another one coming across the Pacific Northwest promises to bring with it quite a bit of weather. And the overall picture for later on this weekend showing rain over the West Coast, frigid across the Central Plains, windy and colder, and the overall Christmas Eve uh, Forecast is calling for snow across much of the Rocky Mountain areas, rain over the Pacific Northwest, blustery and cold across the uh, Great Lakes, showers across the Deep South, so quite a bit of weather expected. Well, back to Alaska for tomorrow. First of all, looking in the northern sections, partly cloudy in Barrow, cloudy at Nome, ice fog expected for Fort Yukon, 36 below for the high there. Here in the interior, looking at ice fog lifting at Fairbanks, but means uh, mostly sunny skies in Denali Park and the cold temperatures will return. As you can see here over the uh, southeast sections of the state, cloudy and windy in Juneau, just cloudy skies with a few snow showers at Ketchikan. And over the southwest part of the state, we're looking at uh, mostly cloudy skies for Bethel and Cold Bay with sunny skies at Kodiak Island. Not too bad in the south central regions, mostly sunny but breezy for Anchorage, Homer, and Valdez. Uh, once again, time for our kids' weather, and this week we're talking with the kids from the Nordale Elementary School area. And tonight, uh, one of the young men from the class has a question for me about cold. I am Alante. I'm in. I I am in Mr. Harrison's class. I'm in fifth grade at Nordale Elementary School, and this is my question for the weatherman. What is the coldest weather you've been in? I would have to say in 1993, it got down to 62 below in the area I was living in here in the Fairbanks area. So that's definitely the coldest temperatures I've ever been associated with. And I don't want to see those again for a long time. Again, thanks to Mount McKinley Bank. And tomorrow night, the teacher will be here with a unique weather fact. Okay, here's our forecast for the remainder of the night. As you can see, we're looking at uh, foggy conditions, clouds and flurries decreasing, some ice fog. Looks like uh, 36 below for the overnight low. Tomorrow's forecast, 32 degrees below zero, morning ice fog becoming partly cloudy. And our extended forecast for the five-day period, again, looking at the ice fog on Friday, and then we're looking at uh, the, the uh, daylight coming back again for Saturday. We're all excited about that. Temperatures will slowly, like I said, warm up. We're looking at the temperatures to warm up to around 10 degrees below zero for the uh, daytime highs. The overnight lows will also be cool, warming up a little bit to 25 degrees below zero. And on Christmas Eve, as you can see here, Santa Claus looks like he's going to be fighting a little bit of cold temperatures as he f moves into the Ardor area. Oh, uh, well, that's not too terrible. I mean, 10 below, I mean, after the whole month of 30 below, 40 below, uh, yeah. 10 below sounds like uh, balmy. It sounds like, it sounds like five degrees to me. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good. All right, well, thank you, Mike. And that will wrap up this edition of the Fairbanks Evening News. As always, we are glad you could join us. Tonight on NBC Nightly News, a huge winter storm threatening to wreak havoc during the holidays in the lower 48. That's next with Brian Williams. Be sure to join us here six days a week and at 11 
or online anytime at webcenter11.com. Okay, that's enough from us. From all of us here at the News Center, we hope you have a great warm evening. Good night. <laughs> Good night.